my deal. I don't use PowerPoint. Um, I just tell stories. I am lucky that I can tell some stories. Some of them are funny. I like to think there's some value in them. I give away books. I give away Starbucks cards. I give a lot of fun stuff. I curse. But I am, I am not your typical keynote, but that does get me the gigs at like American Express, Disney, uh, SAP, Oracle, Saudi Aramco, really, really big companies. I go on TV a lot talking about this stuff, primarily because I love it. And um, anything I say is public knowledge and public, or it's public, uh, you're welcome to share it. I, um, just, I'm, I have massive ADHD, so I'm just saying, ooh, books, 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 books. Actually, I have something much worse called ADOS, which is attention deficit, ooh, shiny. And um, I actually run the number one podcast on the internet called, for ADHD called Faster Than Normal, where we actually focus on ADHD as a gift. It's a real thing. We have today's episode, which aired this morning, we had Tony Robbins on the podcast. It was like a total win for me, so it's been a good day. But I'm just going to tell you some stories. And I talk about the customer experience, and I talk about marketing, and I talk about a little bit of sales, and I wasn't supposed to be doing any of this shit because I was in graduate school in the early 90s studying fashion and portrait photography in Santa Barbara, California, because it was a great way to meet women. And, no, it was. I was on a beach with a camera. Do the math. Um, I had 18 credits to go, and I lost my financial aid. The government sent me a letter that said, your parents make too much money. We're taking away your financial aid. And I sent the government back a letter that said, my parents do make too much money. And they keep it. And <laughs> The government didn't find that funny. Anything I say, like I said, it's public knowledge. Feel free to share it, tweet it, post it. You're welcome to do that. I encourage it. I'm flattered when you do it. It means I'm giving you value. And you don't have to hide your phones. I teach at a university in New York. I know when my students are on their phone. No one ever looks down at their crotch and smiles. So just <laughs> pull your phone out, post, go for it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. All of a sudden, you know, you can hang for 30 minutes before the bar. It's OK. So, What's my story? I, I, um, I moved back home from grad school in the early 90s. I was born and raised in New York City kid, born and raised in Manhattan, and uh, moved back home with 18 credits to go in grad school, and I, I uh, was hanging. Anyone here under 30? All right, some of the shit I'm going to say is going to make any sense to you. I was hanging out in something called the Melrose Place TV gossip chat room <laughs> on America Online. It's like Twittering about House of Cards, but it's, it's not a device, it's a box that's connected to a thing on the floor that's connected to a, a phone line. Google modem, M-O-D-E-M. -E anyway, we'd, we'd type something in this chat room, and we'd go get a slice of pizza, and we'd come back, someone would type something back to us, and that's what we did before dating. And I was in this chat room, and someone said, my company's trying to build a newsroom. You seem to have a journalism degree from Boston University. Why don't you submit your resume? I said, sure, I have no experience. This will be awesome. And I learned that sarcasm doesn't translate well on the internet, and I was moved down to Virginia uh, to become the first founding editor of the America Online Newsroom. So in the early 90s, when AOL was the internet, uh, I launched AOL News with three other editors. We were completely clueless. We had absolutely no idea what we were doing. Uh, people thought we worked for the internet. We worked for AOL. They thought we walked into a room every day. On the door was a sign that said the internet. We went in, and me and Al Gore, just hanging out. Um, but the amazing thing about this was that we built the first ever digital newsroom. And we built AOL News from about 200,000 members to 10 million members over the course of three years. And I learned something during those three years that stuck with me forever and ever. We were, at the time, AOL was in uh, Vienna, Virginia. Uh, we were sharing space with the, with the Feld group, the, the Ringling Brothers people. It's like, like at least once a month, there'd be a fucking elephant walking through our lobby. It was cool. It was like, Look, the elephant's here. We don't know. But, um, one of the things we learned is that we, we had these massive internet pipes coming into our, into our offices called T1 and T3 lines. They were the fastest internet pipes in the world at the time. So we would be online looking at you know, as much data as we wanted. It looked amazing. And so we'd build stuff on AOL. We'd build platforms, and we'd build messaging, and we'd build news outlets and all that stuff, uh, looking at it through these massive pipes, kind of forgetting that the people who were using AOL primarily lived in trailer parks in like Mississippi and Wisconsin, and were lucky to have a 300 baud modem. Right? Remember, please wait, downloading art? So you'd, da you'd, you'd, ha you'd, you'd go to a site, you'd start to download something, you'd go to sleep, you'd wake up the next morning, it was 94% done? <laughs> that was us, our bad. But we learned something fascinating is that we actually thought we were controlling the direction of what our customers wanted, and we weren't controlling Jack. Our customers were controlling what, we, what they wanted. And if we didn't learn to give it to them the way they wanted it, they were going to go somewhere else. 
And that was a really great lesson to learn as early as I learned it, because that was my first job at a school. And so I walked away from America Online with this incredible logic that, holy crap, if I just listen to the customers, they're going to tell me exactly what they want me to do, and then all I have to do is do it. I can't believe no one else knows this. I moved back to New York. It was the summer of 1998. Um, I had no money. I wanted to start a PR firm. I, the dot-com boom was starting. I thought I could do PR and you know, do it better than most of the big firms, but I had no money. And there was an independent film. Uh, there were some um, movie guys here who I sat with at lunch. Who, who were you? Raise your hands. Where'd you guys go? Yeah, OK. So remember, remember this there was an independent film that came out in the late 90s. I don't know if you guys had it. It wasn't very, it was called Titanic. OK. So anywhere you look in New York in the late 90s, buy Titanic on video. Buy Titanic. Get it here. Buy it on Amazon. Buy it on real.com. Buy it. It will kill your family. And I figured there had to be other people that hated that movie as much as I did. So I took my rent money. Um, and I had 500 t-shirts printed up. And the t-shirts read, it sank, get over it. <laughs> and I went into Times Square and I figured if I could sell 180 shirts at 10 bucks a piece, I'd make my rent money back. I was living in a studio apartment in New York City roughly the size of, like, you. And I figured it would take about, I don't know, a week to sell 180 shirts. I sold 500 shirts in six hours. I came home, I threw $5,000 up in the air, rolled around it naked. You'll never get that image out of your head. I called a reporter at USA Today. I said, I just did something really funny. I thought you'd get a kick out of it. She said, that's hysterical. Are you selling the shirts online? I went, yeah, of course I am. That's why I called you. Duh. This was 1998. There was no cafe press. There was no WordPress. There was Peter and his craptastic HTML skills. The reporter said, great, we'll see what we can do. I immediately forgot about it because ADHD. I woke up the next morning at 5.30 in the morning. It was the hosting provider of my website calling me to ask if I'd started advertising. I said, no, it's 5.30 in the morning. What the hell? They said, sir, normally you get about 100 visitors a day to your website. Most of them are, are you. <laughs> you've had over 37,000 unique visitors in the past two hours. You've crashed our first, second, and third primary servers. You're about to take down our fourth, fifth, and sixth. We only have seven. We just, <laughs> we'd like to know what's up. The story broke on the front page of USA Today. It listed the website. I hung up the phone. As I was hanging it up, it rang again. It was the Howard Stern Show. It was People Magazine. It was Entertainment Weekly. It was Good Morning America. The anti-Titanic t-shirt wound up on 250 news outlets over the next two months. I sold a little over 10,000 shirts on the internet. Uh, by on the internet, I mean that I had a web page that said click here. You'd send me an email that you wanted a shirt. I would mail you my snail mail address. You would e mail me a check. For those old enough to appreciate, I built the Rube Goldberg fulfillment process. <laughs> and my father at the time was a high school principal in New York City, a public school in New York City, a high school, public high school in New York City, who I had him send me his, his every day 10 of his worst detention students after school, and I would buy them pizza in exchange for sitting in my apartment and helping box up t-shirts and take them to the post. Imagine P. Diddy's studio sweatshop after school special. <laughs> Long story short, I sold a little over 10,000 shirts on the internet, cleared 100 grand, started my first PR firm. The reason I bring that up, and this is important for you guys, is because if I tried to do that stuff today, you know what happened? I'd go out, I'd spend my money, I'd have my t-shirts, I'd go outside, and I would, um, the second I held up that first shirt, some 12-year-old idiot with a camera phone would take a picture of my shirt, and within 20 seconds, there would be 15 sites selling my junk, right? Selling my shirt wouldn't make a penny. Brand everything you do. Figure out what makes you different from every single person and company you compete with and brand the shit out of it. Because all you have at the end of the day is your brand. And if someone else decides that they can do your brand better and they do or they worse, they, can, they can't, but they convince people they can, you're gone. The only differentiating factor you have is your brand. What can you do to make it a little better? Uh, someone's going to any tri if you're a triathlete in the room, if you've done any form of triathlon in your life and lived to tell the tale, raise your hand, you get a book. Longest distance? Nice. Which one? Shit, he caught me. Make up a, make up a fake Iron Man. Hurry up. Nice. OK, so I've done Cozumel and I've done Louisville. And I know that it sounds. Pass these back over there. I know it sounds like uh, you look at me and you think, no, Peter, you're confused. You've watched the movie Iron Man while sitting on your ass. But no, I've really done, these are for you. I've really done two Iron Man. And after I finished my first one, I was dating a woman at the time who could never understand, you'll appreciate this, who could never understand why I could never have dinner with her. Who was that? Because I was always going to sleep early to train. Or I could never go to brunch. Brunch is a thing for women. And I could never do that because I was always on a 100 mile bike ride. And so I made a video. And if you've done an Iron Man, you've seen this video. It's these two robots talking to each other called, I'm training for an Iron Man, right? And the woman says, you want to get some dinner at 6 o'clock? She goes, I can't. I have to go to sleep. It's 6.30. Why do you have to go to sleep? I'm training for an Iron Man. 
What's an Ironman? It's a 112 mile bike, a 2.4 mile swim, it's 26.2 mile marathon, it's 17 hours. What the hell is wrong with you? Made this video, I posted online, shared it with some friends. Ha ha ha, very funny. I checked back two days later, 35 views. I checked back two days after that, 135,000 views. Lance Armstrong found it. This was in 2010, before we knew he was made of chemicals, we trusted him. He shared it with his friends. Hey, cyclists, check this out, really funny shit. He tweeted that. The video has about 2 million views right now. At nowhere in this video on YouTube does it say, for more, see Peter Shankman. Blew my shot. If you've done a triathlon, you know about this video. And nowhere did it say. So guys, brand everything you do. Figure out what you're better at than your competition. Work really, really freaking hard at it and brand the hell out of it. Because that's all you have. You have to figure out how to become top of mind so when people are saying, what should we do tonight, they say your name. So, long story short, I, through a series of things, I started a PR firm, I sold it, I did a couple other things, I sold it, and then eventually, I realized that I know everyone, I just don't shut up, I talk, if you're on a plane, like literally, unless, if you're sitting next to me, unless you fake your death, I'm gonna know everything about you by the time we land. And journalists found this out, and they'd start calling me, saying, hey, I'm doing a story on whatever, who do you know? And so I'd launch, I launched something, uh, I would help these journalists find their sources, and it started taking way too long. So I launched a company, little mailing list called Help a Reporter Out, or Harrow. And Harrow lets you, uh, it's a free service, it still is, I encourage you guys to use it if you want some free press, helpareporter.com. Basically you sign up, three times a day you get an email from me. You get an email with queries from journalists all around the world. If you can answer whatever they're asking about, you reply to them, you get quoted in the press. Where's, uh, where's my mini golf, where's my golf girl? Where is she? Sing the praises of Harrow. <laughs> so I started this service um, within a year after starting it for my friends. We had a quarter million members. Within two years, we had half a million members. It was acquired three years after I started it as I was working on it from my apartment and my couch with an overweight cat on either side of me. When it was acquired, it was a game-changing move for me, and I tried to figure out why a very large publicly traded company would come in and pay so much money for something I started for fun. And what I realized is that during the due diligence process, they interviewed 500 of our 500,000 members and our readers, and what they found out is our 500,000 members felt very invested in what we built. They felt like what we built mattered, they felt like what I built at Harrow was really important, and they felt like they had to have it. That gave me credibility. So I spent the next two years trying to figure out what those things were, what did I do? And I came up with four basic rules. And those four basic rules wound up becoming the subject of a book called Nice Companies Finish First and the follow-up book, Zombie Loyalists, Using Great Service to Create Rabid Fans. I have 19 minutes and 13 seconds before the bar. So here is the nutshell of those four rules and what it all comes down to. I'm going to start with the best part first. I don't need you to be awesome. How many of you people flew here? Who had a good flight? What made it good, sir? Uneventful. So it's on time, right? Yeah. Didn't let you fly the plane. You didn't pull a Harrison Ford, come in over LA, right? 100 feet above. Okay. So you sign what's called a contract of carriage, which means that I will give you money and you will fly me somewhere and back at a certain place in time. That's what they did, nothing more. But you in your mind, the greatest flight ever. Holy shit, oh my God, this airline. Okay. The reason you're so over the moon about how great this airline was is because what you expected was to get to the airport have a three mile long line, get to the, finally get to the front of the line, you get pulled aside for the anal probe, you get that through, you get an hour after that, now you have 20 minutes to make your flight, but it's okay because it's right at gate four. But you go to gate four and shock of shocks, they moved it to gate 278 without telling you, which is actually four airports and six states over. So now you're running to gate 278, luggage is dragging you, dropping on stuff, half your clothing's on the ground, but you finally get there, you've had four mini strokes, you get to the gate, you're in seat 4B, so you're good, except you, know, you weren't there 25 minutes before, so now you're in seat 34 bathroom, and your luggage, sorry, that won't work. So now you're in seat 34 bathroom, sandwiched between two 400-pound guys, and by the way, the toilet's broken, it's leaking, and it's gonna be on your shoes the next six hours. Have a good flight. That's what you expected. The fact that it was just uneventful, you're over the damn moon. I don't need you guys to be awesome. I need you to suck a little less. Had Tony Robbins on the podcast this morning, right? Tony Robbins, walk on fire, be your best you can be. Tony Robbins, I love him. We're friends. He's the guy's freaking awesome. But you know what? I need you guys to walk on fire. That shit's hard. I did not need you to do that. You know what I need you to do? I need you to be a little better than what people expect. And you know what the customer service expectation in this country is? Uneventful is awesome. All I need you guys to do is suck a little less. 
than everyone else. I don't even need you to be good. I need you to be a little bit better than what we expect, which is crap. So here are the four ways to be a little bit better than crap. Rule one, be transparent. The gentleman who mentioned over there, he likes to tell his customers exactly how much money is going on their card. Can you stand up, sir? That was a, you get a book, and, and I want to actually come over and shake your hand, because I'm sitting in the back going, dude, him. All right, just the concept that you want to be honest with your customers, bravo, sir. That is exactly what I want you to do. His name is Clarence. Yeah, Clarence is the shit, OK? That's what you want to be doing. Because we don't do that, nor do we expect that. We expect to be lied to. So what is rule one? Clarence epitomizes rule one. Rule one is transparency. Own it. Own it. You're going to screw up. You're going to do things that are pissing off your customers. It's just we're human beings. It's what's going to happen. When you do, <coughs> you have two options. Own it or lie about it. One of those options is going to be OK. The other one is going to get you found out. Back in the 50s, you could pretty much lie about anything. And then the internet came. And now you can't, except if you're president. <laughs> it's neither here nor there, neither here nor there. But the concept of telling the truth is such a radical concept for what we expect in a customer interaction. So I'm going to tell you a story. So just yesterday, I finished the, the process of getting a home equity line. Okay, I own a condo in Manhattan. You think, hey, he owns a condo, he does well for himself, he has good credit, this should be a piece of cake. Well, I work for myself, I don't have a W-2. Enter six months of mortgage hell, right? Trying to get a home equity line. Six months into this thing, I, I know everything about my mortgage broker, he knows everything about me. He calls me last week, I'm in Florida giving another speech, and he goes, all right, Peter, we're gonna be done with this thing, so I just wanna talk to you about that uh, property you own, the other, the rental property, the apartment. He goes, um, I just need the insurance information and that. I'm like, well, it's a, it's a rental property, I don't, there's no insurance on that, I just write that out. Right, right, I just need the insurance. I'm like, no, no, I don't, there's no, I own insurance on my condo, the one that I own. He's like, oh, that rental property, you don't own the whole building? I literally looked at the phone and I said, I'm sorry, um, and my assistant, Megan, awesome woman, she was on the call as well. I said to her, I said, Alex, um, are you seriously asking me if I own a 44-story, multi-hundred-unit apartment building on the corner of 42nd Street and 12th Avenue, the entire fucking building? After six months of working with me, you're asking me if I own the entire building on the corner of 42nd Street and the Hudson River, when all I'm coming to you for is a half of the, are you fucking kidding me? At which point my assistant goes, Peter, you know what, I'm gonna talk to Alex and handle the money, why don't you, um, why don't you just have a nice weekend? And like, I'm like, no, this is why we can't have nice things. And I got to, she's like, Peter, hang up the phone. And she cut me off, she just, I have a great assistant, she knows me, but the guy's been working with me for six months. How the hell do you think I owned a damn building when I'm only trying for a half million dollar home equity line? But that's what we expect. The concept of transparency, if he just said, oh, you know, shit, dude, my bad. Yeah, you own an apartment there. It's all good. I would have been like, yeah, you're a moron, but it's cool. All I need you to do is own it. We have a story of two people, Anthony Weiner and Elliot Spitzer, both New York City political people. Elliot Spitzer was the governor of New York. When he screwed up and had a sexual dalliance, he was outed by the New York Times. He stepped down. He was out of the country within 24 hours. You could not find him. He apologized a year later. He came back. He hosted a CNN show. He'll be back in office in five years. Anthony Weiner was going to be the next mayor of New York. This is not up for debate. This is fact. He was handsome. He had great looks. He had a ha hot wife. He had the Clinton back. This guy was going to be the next mayor. All he had to do with the unions, all he had to do was not screw it up. That proved very, very difficult. <laughs> had he simply gotten on stage and said, you know what, my fellow mayor, I was trying to have some sexy time with my wife. I don't know how to use the Twitter. We would have laughed at him for like 12 hours as it's required by New York City law, and then we would have moved on. Because someone else would have done something stupid, he'd be mayor. Instead, he kept the story alive for six hours by denying it, lying. Remember three weeks in? He said, I was hacked. I must have been hacked by the Chinese. I'm in the green room, about to go in the O'Reilly factor, standing next to Geraldo Rivera, of all people. Right? I turned to Geraldo, I'm like, Geraldo, this is bullshit. No one knew who this guy was. He wasn't, he wasn't important enough to get hacked. Did they hack his zipper? How do you do that? This is ridiculous. <laughs> Geraldo's like, yeah, that's very interesting. Geraldo goes out to the A block on O'Reilly. I'm doing the C block. Geraldo goes out, and Bill O'Reilly says, Geraldo, what do you think of that press conference? Honestly, God, Harada looks at him and says, you know, Bill, I've been giving you a lot of thought. What, did they hack his zipper? He wasn't, I'm like, son of a bitch. So yeah, brand everything you do. But if he had just owned it, he'd be mayor right now. Come on. Own it. You're going to screw up. Because here's why. When you screw up and you fix the problem, you turn a hater into a lover. And there is no greater lover in the world than a former hater. If someone has a problem and you go out of your way to fix it, and now you're on a first name basis, 
they're going to tell everyone how awesome you are. And guess what, guys? No one believes how awesome you are if you're the one that has to tell them. What's your name, ma'am? What is it? Ava. Ava. Let's say I meet Ava at a bar. I don't know her, but I see her. You know, Hi, I'm, I'm Peter. You don't know me, but I'm freaking amazing. Seriously, I'm, I'm that, finish your drink. I'm that good. Come home with me. Let's go. Ava's going to throw a drink right in my face. I've done a lot of research. That's exactly what Ava's going to do. <laughs> but, but if Ava doesn't, if I'm just sitting here over here, like playing Words with Friends or some shit, like not even, by the way, Words with Friends, username is Peter Shankman. Bring it. I have a lot of time on planes. If I'm just sitting here playing Words with Friends, not even paying attention to her, and her best friends, holy shit, that's Peter Shankman. I heard him speak. He's newly single. He's amazing. You should totally go talk. Let me introduce you. Peter, come on. I'm getting Ava's phone number at the very least. Trusted source. Okay? I somehow impressed her friend, and Ava trusts her friend. No one believes you if you say you're awesome. I didn't do it. It's not my fault. I'm great. No one's going to believe that. If, if she tells Ava, you know what? He's actually a really nice guy. Ava's going to give me a chance. Own your mistakes. Let your audience scream about how great you are. The value in that is a billion times more. That's rule one. That's transparency. Rule two is the concept of relevance. Relevance is very simple. How many of you get your news from a newspaper? Okay, I still read the Sunday Times. I like newspapers. Okay, TV, radio, print, web, blogs, magazine. Okay, every time I raise my hand, every time I ask something, someone raised their hand for different things. Back in the 50s, we got our news from a newspaper in the morning and the nightly news in the evening. That was it. Okay, like 79% of the, of the world watched the nightly news. Problem is, today's audience is fractured. I get my news from podcasts that download at 3 in the morning. I'm one of those weird, annoying people that's up at 4 a.m. It's, it's the ADHD thing. I've got to exercise first thing in the morning. So I'm either at the gym or <clears throat> outside running. If, if you Google me, I'm the guy that got arrested. No bullshit. I got arrested in Central Park three years ago now for exercising before it opened. <laughs> apparently, nature closes in New York. I lived there all my life. I didn't know this. And it's, apparently, it's also not the right answer when the cop stops you and has his hand in his gun saying, what are you doing? And I'm like, what do you think I'm doing? I'm sweating him in spandex. It's fourth day. I'm giving hand jobs for crack. What do you think I'm doing? I'm running. Hand jobs for crack. Wrong answer. That will get you arrested. So, <laughs> lesson learned, right? Point being, point being, I get my exercise first thing in the morning, and when I'm doing it, I am listening to my podcast, BBC, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, whatever, because that is the only time I have to get my information. You might get your information from the radio. You might get it from TV. You might get it from a podcast. Whatever the case may be, Everyone's fractured. So if you have an audience of people that come to your establishment, to you, who you sell to, who give you money, the least you could do is have enough respect for them to ask them how they like to get their information, how they like to be sold to, and give it to them the way they want. The reason Harrow did so well was because the first thing that people said is, yeah, every time we have a, a request, we just email Peter. If he can make the change, he does. We love him. I didn't know I was doing anything different. I was just answering emails. Ask your audience how they like to get their information and give it to them the way they want. When you do that, you have a 2.4 times higher rate of investment. That means that your customers, if they say, I only want texts or I only want email, whatever, if you give it to them the way they ask for it, you immediately increase your retention and increase your investment, how they believe in you, by 2.4 times. Just by listening and doing what they say. Be relevant to your audience. That's it. By the way, relevance, if you want a, a, a dollar sign on that, I, I'm, I work for a nonprofit. In my spare time, I jump out of airplanes. I'm a licensed skydiver. And um, I had about 400 jumps. One of my friends was killed at a base jump several years ago. And her husband asked to, us to donate to this animal nonprofit that she worked, she volunteered for. I sent him a check. They sent me a coffee table book. I looked at it for about a day. Oh, this is gorgeous, whatever. Got bored, threw it in a corner. And over the course of the next few weeks, every time I leave my small apartment, I saw it and it pissed me off because I'm like, how, many, how much of my money did it cost to print mail and produce this book? Why did the hell did they send me a video that I could have shared? So I call them. Oh, well, we believe most of our donors are older and they probably prefer print. I'm like, oh, you've done research. Well, we just assumed. I'm like, God damn it. It really pissed me off. So I joined their board and spent the next year interviewing every current and past donor, asking them how they like to get their information. 94% of them said we'd like to get our information online. Shocking. So we started a Facebook page, a Twitter page, a YouTube channel, an email mailing list, a Twitter handle, everything. What happened? Donations went up 37% in 12 months. Oh, and they saved $500,000 on printing, mailing, and reproduction. 37% increase in revenue, $500,000 decrease in costs, simply by listening. That's rule two. Rule three is the concept of relevance. Relevance is where it gets fun. So. 
the best way to describe relevance. What's the best way to describe relevance? So the average attention span of someone between the ages of 18 and 55, the first time you're trying to get their attention, what is it? What is it? 30 seconds? Anyone else? Let's do a, let's do a sale of the century thing. Closest answer wins. Eight seconds, nine seconds? Two. Who said two? Three. Well, if we're going by those game show rules, two, you've gone below the actual thing. Three is the closest without going under. 2.7 seconds. So whoever said three, come get your book. Right. I'm, I'm not walking all the way over to you. Come get your book. So 2.7 seconds to reach your audience. So if you have an audience with an attention span of 2.7 seconds, by the way, 2.7 seconds is roughly 140 characters. 140 characters is what? Let's not say Twitter. Let's say a mobile message. Here's why. Twitter's going to die. I love Twitter. Use it religiously, at Peter Shankman. But it's going to die. Because here's the thing. 6% of, of the United States has ever sent or received a tweet. 89% of the world has been involved in the sending or receiving of a text message. Mobile is not the same as Twitter. Understand the difference. I'll rant for half a second. On September 11, 2001, I was third for takeoff on the runway at Newark on a United flight heading to the West Coast when the first tower was hit. All my parents knew at that time was their only child was on a United flight heading to the West Coast. All I knew is both my parents were working downtown at NYU as professors at around that time. Couldn't get through to them on cell phones. They couldn't get through to me on cell phones. An hour and a half later, we never took off. I was able to send a text message to my father's phone that read, not my plane. This was 2001. Flip phones. I had this image of my father getting the text message, confusing it with the voicemail icon. I don't have a voicemail. Why does it keep saying I have it? I can't get rid of this thing. They'd never sent to receive a text in their lives. That was the first time they'd ever sent to receive a text message in their lives. They got it. It's 15, 16 years later. I, I can't get them to stop texting me. <laughs> it's really not funny. They went to Asia about six months ago like I was there. And they have WhatsApp now, so it was like I was there with pictures 12 hours in the future. And so from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., every it's a Japanese dog, it's a Japanese tree, it's Japanese, my, I get it. Yep. No, it's just called Japanese, they just call it food, you're in Japan, you have Japanese food, yep. I have a three-year-old daughter, they watch her when I'm out of town, which is a lot. Um, yeah, they still don't, so I'm in, I'm in Malaysia, I'm in, I'm in uh, the Philippines in two weeks. I guarantee you, from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m., I'm going to get 50 pictures of my daughter doing exactly whatever the hell she does when I'm with her, but it's going to be from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. My parents love texting. They don't get Twitter. They follow me on it to see what I'm saying. They don't tweet. When I say something self-deprecating every morning, my Jewish mother gets upset and picks up the phone and calls me to discuss it. That's like my going to your house to see if you got the FedEx. <laughs> my father just replies like it was a text message, but to Twitter. Not to at Peter Shankman, but just to Twitter. So if you read my father's stream, I remember that. Yes, 42. That was funny. Your daughter, 12. What the? F <laughs> and they're smart people. They're not stupid, but they don't see any value in Twitter. The reason I bring that up and, and emphasize that point, embrace the concept, not the brand. Twitter's bullshit. It's not going to survive. I love it, but it's not going to survive. Mobile is a revolution. Twitter's a pipe. Twitter's a pipe that carries mobile content. Understand that difference. Anyway, point being, if you have 2.7 seconds or 140 characters to reach your audience, guys, hear me when I say this, become better communicators. If you are writing advertisements, if you are creating videos, if you are doing any of that stuff, either pay someone who does it better than you or take a class. I will never, ever do my own animation because I suck at it. And the amount of time I spend sucking at it and producing a crappy product is worth the three, four, five hundred dollars I'm gonna pay someone to get it done in 30 minutes and have it look awesome. Create great content. It's so easy to create great content. You can do about 90% of it on your own. We had someone, where's, where's, our, where's my lunchtime guy who was flying a goddamn DJI Phantom 3? He was flying a drone in here taking pictures of you and it looked awesome. You can create your own content, but give it to someone else to look awesome. Make the finished product something you're proud of, something you'd look at and say, you know what, I wanna go there. That's good content. Good content forces people to look at it for more than 2.7 seconds. And if you can hook someone in past that 2.7 second mark, they are three times more likely to spend money with you. Create something worth it. And here's an added tip. Stop trying to create anything viral. You can't create anything viral. You want to create something viral? I have a three-year-old. Let me tell you something. She's viral. 
I live with a goddamn Petri dish. I'm sick every week thanks to this kid in her damn preschool. You want to create something viral? Don't. Create something good. Focus on building good quality content. It'll go viral automatically. That's the difference. Good stuff goes viral. Bad crap is called viral. It's totally different. Embrace the concept, not the brand, and create good content. That's rule three. That's brevity. Rule four is the concept of top of mind. And this is where everything fine tunes into a point. So back in the 70s, um, for my movie theater people, back in the 70s, there was a guy named Barry Diller. What was he the CEO of in the, in the 70s? No. No. Come on, no. Keep going. Begins with a P. Thank you, Paramount. Barry Diller took the helm at Paramount in 1974. You know what Paramount was in 1974? About 11 inches from bankruptcy. It was the worst studio in Hollywood. They literally were dying. Barry Diller came out of being an agent and went to Paramount, and everyone said it was career suicide, and he did two things differently than any predecessor before him at Paramount. Barry Diller reached into his Rolodex. Rolodex is like Outlook, but it was cards. You'd turn it. Okay. He'd reach into his Rolodex. <laughs> And he would call 10 random people in his Rolodex every day just to say hi. He didn't try to sell them on anything. This is my special secret, top secret business card that's also a Starbucks card because I've been giving you shit all day. So thank you. Enjoy that. Um, he would call 10 random people in his Rolodex just to say hi. He wouldn't sell them anything. Hey, it's Barry. What are you working on? How's the weather in LA? What's going on in New York? How's London? What can I do? How can I help you? How can I help you are the five most underutilized words in the world. What are you working on that I can help you with? I'm not trying to sell you anything. If you were in Barry Diller's Rolodex, four times a year, you get a call from the head of Paramount, just reaching out. When you're in a movie, you want a greenlit, or you're an actor, you want to sign to a five-picture deal, you could have gone to 20th Century Fox or Warner Brothers or Gulf Western and tried to get them to call you back, or you could have just called Barry, for God's sake. He called you two weeks ago. From 1974 to 1987, when Barry Diller left Paramount, he was responsible for such films as Flashdance, Beverly Hills Cop 1 and 2, uh, Officer and a Gentleman, Three Men and a Baby, um, the list goes on and on, uh, Ghostbusters, I think. He fundamentally changed Hollywood. He created the first billion dollar studio in Hollywood by calling people back. I don't need you guys to be awesome. I need you to be top of mind. Top of mind is reaching out is figuring out who those customers are who come every damn Friday with their kids. And you know what? Being there at 6.30 p.m. when the dad drags his three daughters in because his wife has girls night every other week and he comes in and he's just a zombie because he has no idea how to take care of these four girls. So he brings them in. Maybe you help him out. Right? Maybe you take your best hostess who's also 17 and babysits in her spare time and assign them to her, to him for the night. Right? So he gets a break and he can actually have a beer and not worry that they're being attacked or something. Maybe you do something just a little bit better. And here's the best part about this, guys. This doesn't have to cost anything. I'm not coming in saying, yeah, you could fix all your customer service problems for 34 cents on the dollar. Bullshit. A smile is free. Understanding your audience is free. Being a little bit better than what we expect is free. But the profit center on it is monstrous. So I'm going to leave you with two stories that define this. <clears throat> First story, I travel constantly. I do it a quarter million miles a year. And I am very, very loyal to United Airlines. And I love United. They are a great airline. I, I, they treat me very well. I'm what's called global services with them, which means that I can leave my apartment at 5.45 a.m. for a uh, 6.15 a.m. flight. Right? They take very good care of me. At the end of every flight, they send me a little email. It says, tell us how we did. You know, and it's, we, we care about your opinion, yet the email comes from, you know, do not reply. We care about your opinion. Tell us about our flight. And I always say, you know, great flight, easy piece of cake. I took it this morning. Last line of the email. Tell us what we could do to make your next flight even better. As of this morning, it's been 442 flights in a row. I have responded with the same line. On my next flight, please refer to me as Peter, Lord of the Skies. Now, here's the thing. I don't expect them to do that. 
But you know what would be nice after 442 emails with the same exact line? I would love a phone call. Hi, Ms. Shankman. We're not going to fucking do that. Stop it. Just, you're an asshole. Cut it out. Anything to tell me that they're listening. Because my flights are pretty good, because like I said, they treat me really well. But what if I have five really bad flights in a row? And I do have a problem. Am I going to leave United? Probably not. But you know what they're doing? They're opening a door. They're opening a door for Delta or American. If I tweet out, oh my god, fourth flight in a row, what the hell, United? Get your shit together. I guarantee you someone at Delta and someone at American are following me. And there's a little bit of ambiguity there and a little bit of disingenuousness. In fact, they haven't, in 442 emails, said one thing. If Delta should show up, Mr. Shankman, hey, how's it going? Yeah, heard you having a problem. Want to try us? We'll match your status. We have drugs, whatever it is. Am I going to go? I don't know. But they're opening a door. Be real. Be real to your audience. That's the first story. Second story, and then I'll close. I, I see it. Jim's back there. He's like, hurry. OK. Here's my second story. Put up that last slide. Put up the one slide. Sorry, I told you I don't do PowerPoint. I have one slide for you that I want to show you guys. So I wouldn't, this, none of this crap would be real if I didn't eat my own dog food. That's my actual cell phone number. It rings to this very phone. I encourage you to text, text instead of call. I, in a perfect world, just, let's just text, OK? Um, <clears throat> but text me. Reach out to me. That bit.ly.com, notes for PS, that's my mailing list. Um, if you text Shankman to uh, 4422, I don't know what the hell it is. Just go to that. Like, point being, I answer on my own email. I answer on my own cell phones because I think it's the right thing to do. If you're ever in New York, you want to go for a run in Central Park a little later than 4.30 in the morning, if you want to just call me and ask for ideas, if you want to, hey, I'm working on this thing. What do you think about this first? Don't ask me to write your marketing plan for you, but if you have a question, I'll answer it because I'm a nice guy and that's, the universe needs more nice guys. Yes, it really is my number, 727. What did I just, what did I just say? I just said don't call me. And 727 just, this is why we can't have nice things. So yes, call me anytime, text me anytime. I would love to communicate with you guys. And I have to leave that up because I'm real. That's my email. But here's my last story. I was flying, uh, I landed in Phoenix a couple of years ago, and I had a, um, I had a uh, rental car from uh, Hertz. And I get to the counter, and uh, I have a gold, gold membership, gold card with Hertz, right? Which, it's like, it's like having a Discover card. It basically, you know, it doesn't mean anything. It just means my name is on the wall. I can go right to my car. My name's on the wall. All right, shit happens, right? So I go to the VIP counter, the gold counter. <laughs> There's like 45 people in front of me, huge line. About 30 minutes in, the guy, the one guy working at the gold counter says, you guys might have better luck if you go upstairs uh, to the main counter. There might be more people working. Okay. Go upstairs. There's a two and a half hour wait. Two and a half hours later, I'm tweeting out to Hertz. Hey, Hertz, can you please stop sucking? I just need a car. This is ridiculous. Two and a half hours. I'm getting old. I'm dying. No response. I finally leave the counter, and the guy's like, yeah, have your reservation? I'm like, yeah, here you go. He's like, um, oh, you're a gold member. I'm like, yeah. He's like, OK, you have to go downstairs. I'm like, like all right, why don't, why don't we put a pin in that? See, they sent me up here for you to handle it. Right, right, but you're a gold member. You have to go downstairs. I'm like, no, no, I, I, I see my reservation. I, they have to handle it. No, sir, I, there's no they. You're the same company. I believe you could do this. He says, sorry, it's policy, and he nexts me. He goes, next. Now, I'm not anyone special, just, but don't next your customer. I don't care who they are. But you ever been to Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport? You know, you know what, what's, what's there at the rental cars? All the rental car facilities are in the exact same place. It's just a giant wall. You've been there, yeah. So I walked 50 feet from the cesspool of filth and depravity that was Hertz, 50 feet, literally this far, to the Zen garden of peace and tranquility that was Avis. And, and you know what happened when I got to Avis? I met Phyllis. Phyllis worked there at Avis. And, and Phyllis, who moved to Phoenix from Detroit with her husband, Walter, because the weather in Phoenix was better for his asthma. She told me all this. Um, Phyllis <clears throat> had me in a cheaper car for a nicer, a nicer car for a cheaper price with a smile on my face and a smile on her face. And like five seconds later, I'm in the car. And she actually even introduced me to Ramon. Ramon is the general manager of Avis Sky Harbor Airport. And here's how she introduced me. Ramon, come meet Mr. Shankman. He's another Hertz refugee. Now, <laughs> now I am not an MBA, but I'm pretty damn sure that if your company has a name for the people that you continually, if your biggest competitor is named the people you're screwing over, you're going to want to fix that shit, right? But here's the best part. So I get home and I write a blog post because I just had my daughter. So I read a blog post called Peter and Hertz and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Really Bad Customer Experience. <clears throat> and I post it on my blog. And I, I include something like the things I'd rather do than ever rent from Hertz again. And I think one of them was um, ride a razor blade bus through a lemon juice waterfall. And 
like 20 minutes after I posted, of course, I get a call from the North American general manager of Hertz. Mr. Shankman, oh, we heard you had a problem. How can we help you? I'm like, well, you could have when I was tweeting your asses four hours ago. Now you can't do shit because I'm already with Avis. Here's the best part, though. A week later in the mail, back at home in New York, a package shows up. It's a chairman's club membership from Avis, which is really nice. They didn't have to do that. I had no status with them. But the letter is what I'm always going to remember. Dear Mr. Shankman, we are in receipt of a blog post that you wrote where you said such wonderful things about our team member, Phyllis. Not thanks for trashing our competitor, not thanks for making me look good, but thanks for taking care of one of our own. They then, no bullshit, they actually spent the next paragraph telling me that Phyllis moved there from Detroit for the weather and the, her husband, I'm like, yeah, I get that part. <clears throat> do you think I'm ever gonna use any other rental car but Avis? And here's the thing, how many times do I tell this story? How many times do the parents who have the three, the father who has the three daughters when her mom goes out that night and has to drag them to your place and they have no, he has no idea what to do, he has a great experience? Who are that dad's friends? Hannibal Lecter and Sansa Lamb said it best, we covet what we know. Who are his friends, other dads? And here's why this matters. Last point, because what used to be a sewing circle 50 years ago where people would get together and they'd talk about what was interesting, 10 years ago became Yelp. Yelp's dead in two years. No one gives a shit about a review from someone they don't care about. You know what's going to matter? When I land in Los Angeles or Santa Bar San, uh, San Francisco and I type in, show me steakhouses near my hotel, Google Maps is going to show me a steakhouse near my hotel, but you know what's going to show me above that? Steakhouses my friends have been to where they've had a good time. And not because they left a review, but because of the length of time they were there. For how long their GPS said they're there. For the amount of tip on their American Express card. For the tweet they posted. For the sentiment of their posts. The experience is the commitment. If I have a good experience, I don't have to leave a review, I don't have to do anything. The simple act of my existing is going to drag all of my friends there because if I take my daughter to your establishment and she has a great time, and I'm posting photos left and right, when my friends are Googling where should I take my daughter, you know what's gonna come up? Not reviews, my posts. And you know who trusts me? My friends. Be a little bit better than what we expect. You will rule the world. That's me, I'm here all night. Reach out, thanks for spending some time with me. Thank you.